Protect your brand, product, or invention from the hazards of consumer product launching and go from idea to product to big brand with guidance from retail product design and development experts Tracy and Tom Hazard. Get the insider secrets to put the right things in the right order with the right resources so you can out-design, outsource, and out-profit your way to retail success. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Product Launch Hazards. I'm Tracy Hazard, and I am super excited to introduce you to someone who I've gotten to know who has written a book that you are going to just love as Stolen on TV. I know you're going to be really excited. So this is stealing the American dream one invention at a time. So you inventors out there, I know who you are because you email me, you message me, you send uh, messages through LinkedIn because you listen so carefully to the show that you know that that's the only place I'll respond to you. So I have Paula Brilson Phillips here and I'm so excited for you to talk to her. So she is an attorney. And she has some amazing stories and experiences. And we met at an event. um, I don't know. I guess it was maybe 18 months ago. It was not too long ago. And we just hit it off because we had so much similar experiences with all of you out there and with our own personal journey and how things go. And so Paula has built her career advising startup companies and mentoring hundreds of individual inventors worldwide help you navigate the complex processes of getting a business or product off the ground, which as you know from this podcast is very complex. She also works directly with companies and executives to help them make effective decisions on protecting their IP and meeting their business goals because we talk about that here all the time. If you're going to build a business around a product, you've got to make the intellectual property a part of that strategic process. Um, And at the end, you want to leverage the value of what you've already created, right? You don't want to just patent and then keep patenting and not leverage and use what you have. We, we talk about this book, Rembrandt's in the Attic. You don't need that. You need to use it and make money from it. For more than 20 years, Paula has successfully navigated hundreds of small, small businesses through the legal hurdles, and we're going to talk about some of those, they face in starting and running their businesses, and she represents clients in investigative and enforcement proceedings, which is something totally new here, by the Federal Trade Commission, state attorneys generals, district attorneys, other federal state agencies with jurisdiction over advertising and marketing practices, which are some of what you're going to deal a whole lot more with, not just the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and, and proceedings related to that. So I am so excited to ha- to. Um, have her here and talk with you. I'm excited to write up an article about this because it has been one of the missing links in my column. But before we start, I, and before I totally introduce her, as she's sitting here on camera, if you're watching the video, so patiently, I want to read something because I think this sets the tone for how Paula is and feels about all of you creators and inventors out there. She says, you see, inventors like children are vulnerable. Their products are like their babies, and they have a sense of true emotion and pride in them. They want to be told that their baby is beautiful. It just so happens that, after toiling for hours to perfect an invention, the emotions that often make the belief so heartfelt, so strong, that a particular product will be a huge success is a primal feeling of hope. Hope, after all, is one of the strongest feelings humans have, powering us to great heights and remarkable lows as we swing like a pendulum between hope and its opposite pole, despair. Hope can also turn us into suckers. And as you know here on on this show, our mantra is, if I don't say it in every episode, it would be shocking. So those of you out there, if you can point out an episode I didn't say it in, hope is not a plan. Uh, you can, if you point out an episode where I didn't say it in, I will give you a free strategy session. So message me. <laughs> anyway, Paula, welcome to the show. So excited to talk with you. Thank you, Tracy. Really great to be on your show. I've watched many episodes and uh, you're just a wonderful probing interviewer and you bring in compelling speakers that really do add value to the whole um, you know, learning process for inventors. So thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you. It, Product Launch Hazards here is about those hazards, and you're talking about a lot of them, right? The, those pitfalls, those things that make us suckers as inventors, the things we all fall into. I've fallen into them. You know hundreds of stories of people who have. There's many written in the book here, some brilliant stories that I had, things that I hadn't even thought about that go wrong and are so devious, and I can see someone falling into so easily. And I just, you know, tell me what compelled you to write this book. 
working with inventors for many years and and basically when they come to me with a um, a struggle a problem that they're facing I quickly get to work to help them and in many instances they don't have the resources needed to protect their rights um, I sometimes feel like the doctor where a patient comes and says I have this life-saving strategy for you which is going to cost you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or sorry I can't help you and 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 so in that way it, I, I have this feeling of, of being powerless and um, and so uh, I realized you know all there's a common thread of problems that I've been dealing with for many years and I compiled them you know in some instances it's uh, don't let this happen to you and hopefully help inventors avoid, if not mitigate, um, some of the issues. But I also just felt like um, I wanted those. I wanted those stories to be told. I wanted uh, the inventors and the entrepreneurs to have a voice. The ones that you know didn't have the resources to pursue their their wrongdoers, that they would at least be able to be heard and have their story told. And I was glad that I could provide a vehicle for that. Well, you know, and you point out so many good. Uh, like, you know, ways that we fall into these traps as inventors, because, you know, it's, it's the advisors and the circles and the people we're around. It's not like some of this stuff would occur to us because people are naturally like, you know, people are naturally good, but there's a lot of scam artists out there and a lot of convoluted scams that are going on that, uh, you know, go after multiple, many, many, many inventors. And we're supposed, we thought we were protected, right? You talk about, um, you know, 1990, I think it was 1999, we, there was an, the, the act was passed that required disclosure from all these invention agencies. Um, and, um, and when they start disclosing their numbers, it was shocking to me. So I say here on the show a lot, seven out of 10 consumer products fail. That's the numbers that we work with mostly in mass markets. So I have a very particular industry that we work on. Um, and yet these invention groups have 0.01% success rates and 0.5% success rates by their own numbers that they post on their sites. So the odds are truly stacked against you from success if you're using what appears in front of you, what's being pushed out to you in TV commercials, the people that are sponsoring events for inventors. That's so scary. So that I'm so glad you're raising awareness for it. So are these numbers real? I mean, like, do the, are they still as prevalent as they were when you when you started writing the book? Well, thank you. These companies that advertise are, are master manipulators. I mean, if you think about the resources they put into these advertising and their very sleek marketing kits, and you know, something's got to support uh, that whole machine. So actually, I think the stats are worse than what has been reported simply because of two facts. One is, you know, if a company is measuring their success by how many licensing agreements they got for uh, an inventor, and those licensing agreements are some of them test agreements, which is no commitment, um, and and no understanding of whether or not royalties are ever going to uh, result. And if they're if these companies, these invention submission companies are considering that as part of their success record, that's misleading. Secondly, anyone pretty much can get a licensing deal. Whether or not it's a good licensing deal is another thing. And that's when we talk about you know this um, this you know primal feeling of hope. Inventors says, They're I'm tapping in that, that, aren't they? Yeah. I just got an offer to deal. My product's going to be in Fed Bath and Beyond. My product's going to be on Target. And it's like, well, are they giving it away? Are you actually going to make money off of this product? And yet, these, in, in not just invention submission companies, but consultants are you know, rolling them out on their website as their big success story. And what, fast forward, was there success? Did that inventor ever make any money? And that's why it's like these stats, I, I'm, you know, I'm fairly certain, or even um, you know, better, if you're talking about a point percent, uh, are better than what, what actually exists. 
You know, it's so crazy. So licensing deals are something that I'd love to talk about because we get a lot of questions there. And you point out so many, you, you have a whole chapter that is brilliant on contracts, everyone. Buy the book just for that section because this is stuff you will not read, you will not hear anywhere else. This is not practical experience of how a licensing deal or how a con contract for royalties and all of those things work about how it it actually works are just not apparent out there. And you don't, there, there's no, how do I say this? There's no templated language you should follow, as you know, I'm sure, Paula, but it's just not out there in some way that this, it works this way. There's always all these tricks and sell-off clauses and uh, how royalties are calculated. There's so much complexity to it. This is not something that you can do without a really experienced lawyer. And I'm here to tell many, many stories, and I think I probably told them on the show already, many, many stories of, I thought I had great attorneys. I paid them a lot of money. And then it turns out when we went to enforce contracts or go through an audit, because we had audit rights built in, it's impractical and it can't be done because the, it was not written properly. So you, knowing someone who knows what it's like on the other side is so critically important in the process. And so Paula, share some of those things that are like typical hazards, traps, right? That they fall into when they get these licensing contracts. Right, so I'll start with the money clause, right? We're pretty much, you know, unless we're here just to change the world in an altruistic way, we're hoping to make a living off of our inventions. And so when it comes to the royalty clause, and um, you know, inventor may be offered 3%, let's say, or 5% royalty, but when you read the fine print and see all of the deductions, which is the difference between the actual royalties and the, what's like the um, which is based on net revenues, which is revenues less costs. But if, when I see a contract that lists out costs, that uh, let's just say is more than three lines. That's already a red flag for me. So if you don't want to- A giant, giant over, paragraph, that's half a page. Start to worry about over it. that cause, there's something wrong with it. I'll start like that. I love that. So a lawyer who doesn't want to see a lot of language here. I love it. Love, Paula, you're amazing. <laughs> but um, so if a company is attempting to deduct costs for which you could never really have any insight into or- have any control over how they spend that money. For example, if a company wants to write off the website development costs, but there's no budget in there for how much they're gonna spend on your website, then we don't know what that number is. Even more concerning is you know, a, co a company that offers a licensing deal to the inventor and they say, we're gonna offer you this percentage. Now we assume we assume that licensee is savvy enough that when they offer that rate to you, they've taken the cost into consideration and they've worked in a, a reasonable compensation for themselves. So when I see that the other costs that will be deducted is commissions for their salespeople, that should have already been accounted for. If right. the inventor is only getting 3%, it's like, I'm handing it all off to you. You're gonna get the rest. I'm going to trust that you're going to negotiate good deals and make sure you're taken care of. So do not add into the deduction clauses an 8% for your overhead or um, commissions for your sales agent or the budget for marketing because that's already assumed when you've offered what many inventors might consider to be a pittance of a 3%. Right. And when I say a pittance because usually inventors in many instances are weighing do I make this product a business and handle the vertical myself, everything from manufacturing to, you know, to getting the distribution into the big box stores, or am I going to hand it off to somebody as my partner who's got all of this infrastructure in place? So, okay, I might not want to run this as a business, so I'll take 3%. 3%. And as far as I'm concerned, that 3% should be the difference between what it costs to make and what you sell it at with some reasonable deductions for maybe there's returns or faulty goods and you know costs that everyone should share it but right, it, it wasn't really product that was sold at the yeah. end of the day right it was product that was returned so right. 
And that clause should not read like a pharmaceutical label. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you wrote that. So, you know, this is, I want to point it out from a practical experience. So I'm a designer. So we typically have royalty arrangements, which are a little bit different than licensing because they're earlier on. But when we structure our licensing deals, we actually have done the same thing at the end of the day. So we actually based it because we know deeply our cost of goods. We know, and that's part of what we do is we plan them in. We, we already know all of the details on that. So when we calculate and figure out what a reasonable royalty should be or what a reasonable rate should be, we calculate it based on the cost of goods and what the margins typically are in the retail market. So we, we look at that and we say, okay, so we can say it's this dollar amount. And very few people do fixed dollar amounts, but you recommend that. And I love that because now it, it, it doesn't matter where it is. The other thing we do is we tie it to net shipments and not to when it gets into retail because that moves it all out of the world of did stuff get returned, did all these things. If the shipment left the port, then we get paid. And that's how we shortened up terms. Like sometimes they make you wait 120 days till they actually get paid before they calculate. So there's calculation side of it is also a problem as well. So we always do net shipment. And that way we have an auditability of being able to, because we have relationships with the factories because we help set them up to check the factory and say how many shipments really went out. And I guarantee you, if you have a good relationship with a factory, they will tell you even if they're not supposed to. <laughs> so. yeah, I, mean, I love that you just brought up the audit clause because that's another yeah. uh, provision that I discuss in the book. So basically the provision usually provides that, um, that they will, the company will agree to maybe a six month look back and only if there's some glaring discrepancies can you look back further. And, um, and so normally there is, uh, there's nothing in there that says, well, what happens if I found out this company, let's just say inadvertently cheated me to put it nicely. Is there a penalty? I think that there's nothing more than a, a better than a financial penalty to keep people on the up and up. And so, and who's going to pay for the cost of that auditor? Because, you know, these are things that are expensive. So if you have an inventor who says, who is getting 3%, who might have not seen a dime of their royalties as of yet, and is questioning the audit clause, and then they've got to pay for the auditor on top of that. Where's that money coming from? And that's why it's like, I always say, keep it real, folks. Even starting with the idea of, you know, an inventor who's always cautious about sharing their idea, and there are many consultants that say, well, sign an NDA. Well, an NDA is only as good as the paper it's written on and your ability to enforce it. Okay. So, I all so want you to hear that because I did a whole entire episode that said the same thing that Paula just said, and she's an attorney. So really that this is exactly how we feel about non-disclosures. We actually, while we have non-disclosures, like when someone submits an idea to me, I'm, I'm accepting that automatically by them just even having a phone call, even if they haven't paid me just to make them comfortable because we don't compete here. That's not what we do here. But the reality is, is that I know and they know it's not enforceable. It's but, always enforceable and yes. your ability to enforce it. And that requires resources. So, you know, and, and let's you point it. that out a lot. There's a lot of resources required. So, and, and, and I've heard this before, and I said this before is that while well, we, we have, I mean, they're up on the wall above, above me up here. Um, but we have patents all over our wall. We have, um, I think cash we're close to 42 or something right now. I don't, I can't, I don't even watch them anymore. Um, and, um, but we have a 95% issuance rate and we um, have an 86% commercialization rate. Um, and so that, those are real numbers there. Um, and um, when I say that we have an 86% success in commercialization rate, so nine out of 10 products actually make it to the market um, and our patents are actually in use. Um, that's what, that's the term that we use. And I have proof on all my numbers. So this is different, but we, the reason it is different is because of the companies I work with, because they're not all solo entrepreneurs, right? They're not all solo inventors. They're big companies who we do multiple products with, who already have a channel, who are already selling into the marketplace. So when we bring the products, they already have a brand that has power and resources. So there's a big difference there. What you're mentioning is that those resources make a huge difference. And so we find too many of these inventors groups, it's all about the patent. Like, I, I can't tell you how many people I'm like, look, I have this binder. 
it's a binder with like drawings and patent and a market research uh, study that is like could be debunked by going on a Google. So you, you've seen it, right? Yeah, and you know, I mean, I talk about there quite a bit in my book in terms of, you know, having the resources to actually enforce your patent. I mean, so one of the things that, I mean, there, there are a number of stories in there, first of all, from the, the product Bunch of Balloons, Josh Malone, who invented this amazing uh, water balloon filler that it fills multiple balloons at the same time. I think he has something like eight kids, so you can imagine it would take hours to start a water balloon fight if you had to fill them each individually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, that was an amazing effort on their part. They had a Kickstarter campaign, they raised money, and um, they entered into a lucrative licensing deal. And then one day, uh, I think a friend called them up and said, hey, I just saw your commercial on TV. And Although, did you change the name though? <laughs> like I think because it was a different name, right? Right. Now that's just one example. And I want to point out that that's one of the reasons why the book is named As Stolen on TV, because a product that's seen on TV, and we all know the As Seen on TV brand, but you know, little, very few people know that once a product is shown, whether it's on TV or it, today's social media or crowdfunding platforms, QVC. Instagram uh, TV now we've got, yeah, you know, who knows where you see it. It's like the inventor is the lamb, you know, the, the lambs to the slaughter. It's like they're on TV. Here's my products and this is what it's sold for. And the bad guys are like, let's order this. Let's order this. We'll change the name. Maybe we'll tweak it a little differently. Yeah, so. so that's one of the things that you point out really well. And this is where we, what we see happen. And I've never put a client through H, um, to uh, QVC um, or HSN. I've never done it. I advise them against it. We've just never done it that way because I know there's a, a high failure rate, high cost rate. And you make very little margin at the end of the day. But it never occurred to me that it was just also making them absolutely ripe. So I'm glad I never advised them to do it. But also making them ripe for stealing it. Because they, these scam companies buy the product straight from the TV show, from whatever your ad is. It could be an online ad, direct response marketing, on you know, Kickstarter, get the reward, whatever it is. They get it. And then they just use it in the actual video that they create while they're making it at, in some factory at the same time. Yeah, when it gets even better, they will actually put a stick, a sticker, or they'll eliminate the. the so they're using the actual product that they bought from QVC, the, the bootleggers, and we'll just call them the bootleggers. And so the actual product that they bought is being filmed in the in the you know the sh uh, the, the short spot, the infomercial, if you will. Um, to test the market and see if there's interest. They'll test it at different price points. And it's like, and that was the product that they bought. And, and sometimes I've heard it three times in the last year. The inventor will say, I sent that product. They were one of my first buyers. And you can imagine that feeling that, you know, just being. Because you know their name when they're one of your first buyers, right? You've yeah. seen their email come through. You're paying attention to it. You know where you ship it to. Yeah, I know. I know. It has to hurt even more because of that. Yeah. Oh, oh, crazy. So there's another one, though. So we just recently did a test, test market. Um, which, you know, is a really important thing to do. Look, I don't want to deter people from doing it, but you should put your protections in place first. And Paula talks about that in the book, that you should have your copyrights, your trademarks. You should use all, all forms of protections, not just patents. Um, because as we talked about, that's a high enforcement rate, resources required to enforce that later. But some of the other things can allow a quick takedown on sites. So they may be more viable to you. But the, we just did a test market on a new product to say, is this viable? Is this going to go really well in the marketplace? But it hadn't occurred to me that the test market group might be vulnerable to that exact thing of where they're just, they don't even care about receiving the product. They're going to copy it straight from the video, the copy, the text, the name, the brand, like every, the, the images, they're just taking the images straight off that landing page. Like it never occurred to me that that would go, it would, could go that deep. Now this product's a little more complicated 
So I'm pretty sure they'll have trouble figuring out how to make it, seeing it took us about nine months to accomplish it. Um, it's well, a technical feat, right. so that's, that's a good story. barrier. But, you know, but otherwise they could make a, a really bad replica that Correct. doesn't work, right? And there it is, your, your baby that you've nurtured for all these months to get to market, finally have a licensing deal. And because an inferior product maybe launched at lightning speed and got to market before you, suddenly your product is destroyed and is dead on arrival before you've even gotten to sell your first unit. Right. And there's no, there's no area of the market that's off limits. As, as you point out in the book, you point out people who had issues with their Amazon listings where they basically were so excited for Black Friday. It's like the big deal, you know, and their listing is all messed up because someone uh, hijacked it. Um, and now Amazon's been putting a lot of, of things in place over the last year and then two years actually to fix some of those things. But if it happens on the wrong day, you've lost a tremendous amount of sales. And so, so you point that out, Kickstarter problems. I mean, you point out someone who went to Kickstarter, put their, put their product in, and then got turned down by Kickstarter, goes to Indiegogo, and then a fake Kickstarter campaign starts for the same exact product. Like crazy information. So tell a little bit about that story, because that one seems just awful, that Kickstarter wouldn't remove it. Right. I believe that was um, Don Soleil with the, the pluck and file and yeah. she created a campaign. And this is, you know, uh, uh, and she was, I think she was raising something like $25,000 and she was wondering why the progress was really slow. And um, what she did one day is actually just want to went, go on Google and put her name in. And by the way, I really recommend that everyone Googles themselves on a regular basis to see what is out there. Oh, Set up a Google alert. This is a great tip. Thank you, Paula, for saying it. A Google alert for your name, your product's name, and, and just set it up so it comes to you every week. Right. I mean, it's, it's no different than we check our bank statements to see if there are any fraud charges because if we wait, you know, nine months, go back to the bank, they're going to say, sorry, you know, you waited too long. So we have to be diligent. The bad guys are using social media and the internet to you know, infiltrate some wrongdoings, we need to use those same resources to monitor what's going on. There's no excuse, folks. It's been around a long time now. We all pretty much know how to use these tools. And so where Dawn is concerned, when she Googled herself, she saw another campaign that mirrored hers. And that that campaign had actually raised more money than she did. And when she reported this, um, the, um, the platform wouldn't take it down. In fact, what they did instead was just suspend the account and say that it was subject to an intellectual property dispute. Now, naturally, anytime somebody Googles the plug and file, Dawn is concerned that because it's not properly explained that it might shed a negative light on her and her product. And, and so again, this is a situation where she feels powerless over what to do. Does she have the resources to pursue an action, to you know, use some uh, you know, legal strategies like subpoenaing the platform to find out who created this campaign and then go after that campaign uh, the provider and perhaps uh, you know, file a, an action against them for intellectual property theft? These things cost money. And if you're an inventor, on one of these platforms to raise money, you're already saying, hey, I need, I need some cash. I need some cash to develop my product. And, um, and probably not a lot of cash left over uh, to divert to enforcing non-disclosure agreements or going after these bootleggers. Right, right, absolutely. Oh, oh, there's so much, so much craziness going on. I want to touch back on a little bit of some of the other contract things. So Tom and I have always talked about on the show here that there are usually three key components that mean that that mean things to the to the inventor. So getting a minimum guarantee, getting upfront money if you can, and obviously the percentage or dollar amount, so the whatever that is. But there are also you know so many other things, but. Out of those things, what are you seeing now out of minimum guarantee upfront money and percentages or dollar um, fixed dollar amounts? Are you seeing uh, trends going on where it's getting harder and harder to get upfront money, percentages are getting smaller? What, what are you seeing ongoing in some of the contracts that you've been reviewing? 
for the most part, when an inventor goes directly to negotiate a distribution deal, the contract that they get back does not include a minimum commitment. If they ask for it, they probably will be turned down simply because they see the inventor as someone who is desperate, who wants to get a deal, and the company feels that they can lean on them and not compromise or negotiate in the same way that they would negotiate with a, an advisor, an attorney, or an inventor who has had repeat success products. Because... These companies want to maintain relationships. They want to maintain their steady flow of supply with the partners that they work with. And so if you're an inventor going in there to represent yourself, you might as well go into a courtroom without a lawyer because you're pretty much dealing with a, a legal concepts that make the difference, again, whether or not you see a dime of your royalties. So uh, the upfront, the advance is not always offered. Now, naturally, if... if I would say if you're a brand new inventor, if it's a product that a company just wants to test, they're not sure about the success, my advice would be once you test it and we hit a certain score uh, in terms of, and I talk about this too, the concepts of how a company determines whether or not they're going to take your product is based on a test score, uh, which has to do with uh, the amount of sales that this company was able to make. So in our, in our marketing terms here, we call that like conversions. It's going to check leads, conversions, and all, and then dollar, dollar actions that will be taken. So they're also sometimes will test price flexibility because that tests profitability. So those are some of the factors that go into the numbers Paul is referring to. Right. So if a company's legitimately, you know, it's a legitimate concern. I don't know how well your product's going to do. Okay, great. How about if I get a test score of 2.1 2.1 and you take my product, then you give me an advance. So there are ways you might not get an advance in the beginning, but negotiated based on meeting milestones. Yeah. And, um, and so there's always a way to show that you're a little more savvy in the negotiation process and always be willing to walk away from a deal and if, if you're not satisfied with it. Because I've seen time and time again that while it's difficult to walk away from the first deal, there might be another licensee right around the corner waiting to, you know, to work with you. And that, and, and then you'll say later, Oh, thank God I didn't sign that first deal. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I love, I love that kind of a- the attitude you have in, when you're writing some of the stories that because you, you know, you, despite the fact that you, you know, you're not, espousing hope here. The reality is, is that you do have hope that they have a good product, that there is future for them. And you tell one of the stories, it's my absolute favorite in the book because I, cause I know you, so I know you kind of how you are with people that I'd love that you just walked up to a couple who was running a booth in a trade show event and said, pack up your stuff and go home because you can't patent this. And if you don't make it to, if you don't go fast and get to market, you'll never make money from this. And I, because everyone's just going to steal your idea right now. And I love that attitude because it shows really that you have their best interests at heart. Like there are a, a hundred different ways to get to market and the unscrupulous are using some really savvy ways that we wish the inventors would. Absolutely. Let's talk about another clause that I see frequently. And you know, the reality is that, well, there are wonderful attorneys, smarter than me in, in many ways, but I have been in the trenches of the product launch and development business for over 12 years. And so I have seen it all. I have seen everyone's contract. I know where there's the pressure points. I know where there's negotiations, or I know to say, don't work with those guys. So let's turn to a clause that is so often overlooked and attorneys that are, if if you do work with an attorney, don't really understand the nuances of the sell off clause. Oh, this is so important guys. I want you to listen up because when, when a contract goes bad and I can tell you that they do, things don't happen on schedule. The product doesn't do as well as anyone thinks they're going to. A good contract prepares you for what's the worst thing that's going to happen. And a sell-off clause is absolutely critical. And then I do also want to say a sunset clause is also really important for any time you sign some letter of intent. I can tell you I didn't, my lawyer forgot to put one in one of the very first contracts I had when we were reviewing a product and I almost got completely screwed out of it. 
and sell. then sell up. Yeah, prepare for the worst. So sell up. We had the conversation that day about a sunset clause, and I literally later in the day I got a, I received a term sheet, and I looked. The first thing it was like on the it was on the top of my head. I the first thing I look for is the sunset clause, and the sunset clause basically is a, let's just explain what the provision is, which basically has a has a you need to do something in a certain amount of time as part of this term sheet or we walk away and right so in other words if you were doing that for this test license is they have six months to do this test in and if they don't then they they lose all rights and this contract is null right like that might be a way to do it so in case there are many many inventors who are afraid of having their patent shelved and a sunset clause works to make sure that that can't happen, that they have to take action in a reasonable time frame. So, but let's talk sell-off clauses because this is really important. What happens if you got your product, it's been selling, maybe it's not lighting the world on fire. And part of the problem is your distributor, they're having issues. And so you say, hey, you didn't meet the guarantee. You didn't meet the commitment. Now we want to end our relationship. What happens there? Right. So now imagine this is going on where the licensee has maybe hundred thousand units of your product and they say thanks Tracy we're no longer going to be able to carry your product we're going to exercise our right to terminate and so that's when the sell-off clause kicks in what happens to those hundred thousand units frequently those contracts do not provide a provision that lets the inventor buy those units back buy those units back at cost or buy those units back at cost plus some small percentage so that needs to be in there. But, right. So here's what happens though. So the sell-off clause basically says, okay, I get to sell off my the inventory I have, but it doesn't include at what price they are able to sell it off at. So folks, when you walk into a big lot store and a dollar store and you see products, most of it being sold at like $9.99, where that product might have been on sale for $29.99 the month before, those products are generally... Uh, the uh, product of a bad sell-off clause because right. it happens all the time and this is what I'm on the other side of that they discontinue products in this way very typically they don't think anything of it it's very common practice for them to move that inventory off their books and they don't care how it happens they do not care about your brand at the end of the day I had one client actually when we we um we did they came to us their contract did not have a good sell-off clause we actually called around to some auction houses in the area of where the distributor was based. My client showed up for the auction and was able to buy his own product back at 10 cents on the dollar. Somebody else would have gotten those items at 10 cents on the dollar. So thank good they were savvy enough. You guys had managed to do that. I love that. So because you know how the system works, you can really help them figure out where it's going to go next. I love that. So, and again, that's important because if you do want to take your product back, fine, it might not have worked out with that particular distributor, but if you want to get that product back, give it to another distributor who might be more aligned in terms of their product mix to sell your product, but your product has been sold off in liquidation at such a low price, your product will never be able to be revived again if you don't have a strong sell-off clauses that, one, give you the right of first refusal to buy it back. And, and to make sure that if they, the company is going to sell it, that they're, they're not undercutting it to where your product is never viable to sell again. Yeah. So, Paula, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Inventor's Right Resolution and Randy Cooper Foundation. So all the proceeds, the profits from the book are going to Randy Cooper. Is that right? The Randy Cooper Foundation. And I love that. Tell me how you formed that. One of the... Um, uh, when Fred and Natasha Ruckel, the inventors of the Ripple Rug, which is a cat toy mat. They were I'm going to have them on the show, guys, so we'll get a deep dive into their story. I look forward to having them. And uh, you know, while they're not lawyers, they are quite the investigators. and they did read, That and they astounded me entire, in the book. <laughs> they uncovered an entire, I would say, ring, a ring of bad actors and understood the nuances of how they work together. Um, to all, you know, come together as all these pieces of a puzzle to take your product to market under a different name. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. It's crazy, right? And that's what happened with Randy Cooper. He was the inventor of the noodle head sprinkler. And I talk about it's a wonderful story of how that product, you know, you know was mastermind and brought it to, uh, to market. And then before 
the the lawn was you know soaked with water from their brand new sprinkler there was the thunderhead sprinkler on the market and several others they're always it's always the case where it's most often an inferior product and it's always the case where it's being sold at a lower cost or with you know hey folks if you act now you'll not only get this but you'll get something else so it's these and wait products. there's more <laughs> So it's, it's really hard for, for a new inventor to, to come up against that. And um, Randy Cooper, he, um, he began going, pursuing the bad guys. And the, and the response was threatening. We're going to sue you. And um, um, sadly, Randy died in his pursuit of, uh, from, from his illness uh, that he kind of lost the, the battle with. Um, his, uh, his wife, Marlene Dumas, is convinced that the fight uh, you know, against the bad guys weakened his resolve in many ways or, or his resistance because of the stress. Anyhow, when, um, when I began to work with Fred and Natasha Ruckel to help them uh, stand up for their rights against the, the bad guys in the, in the case of the Ripple Rug, where they the bad guys or the bootleggers launched a product called uh, Purr and Play, and, um, and they uncovered information where they found out other inventors had been, uh, kind of, had been scammed in the same way. And so I list, I list a number of other products. Some of them. Right. Are- it was astounding. Like they did some deep investigative work. They'd really, and they had other inventors in mind the whole time, which is really wonderful. So that's when we had, we had the idea that, um, inventors don't have any resources where can they go and and say hey can you help me out here if so we you know we know that law firms in many instances will take on a case for content on a contingency basis but they have to have kind of an assurance that this is going to be a slam dunk and if the company who bootlegged your product changed the name then we don't have a trademark infringement claim if, and in most instances, the inventor didn't file a copyright for their images, which, by the way, is such a low-cost protection. Please do that. Yeah. On your website, even take a picture of your own product and, and, and copyright it. So if there's no copyright protection, no statutory damages. So let's say what we're left with is a patent claim. And, um, and so, okay, well, that, this was my patented product. I have a patent that was issued. And so that's fine. I'm going to rely on my patent claim. Oh, no, because we have a little division of the USPTO called the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And this Patent Trial and Appeal Board, I would say, is a Mickey Mouse uh, puppet organization that has been designed by big companies to give the death knell to patents. They have a 90% patent denial or patent reversal rate. In other words, you lose your patent, which is crazy numbers. Like either the patent and trademark office is completely inept or this is corrupt. And that is, you know, that's where we're at. You got the one side of the house that's reviewing a rigorous review of a patent and it takes so long it should be rigorous right specialized people that that award the patent and so here you are i have this patent and i'm going to go out and i might raise money off of that patent and bring in investors i might invest in facilities and a lot of resources to bring this product to market that might change things make things better whatever it is and a big company says this is kind of cool we're going to make the same thing and so the little company thinks, well, I have the patent. I'm going to go and, you know, and, pers- and, and enforce my rights. And but, so these big companies say, oh, yeah, you don't have any rights. You should have never been given this patent. So they file what's called an invalidation uh, proceeding at the PTAB, who is, wait for it, folks, comprised of heads of large companies. <laughs> that are the ones to stand to gain from the invalidation of that patent. Right. The system rigged against inventors right now. You better believe it, folks. And so this petition. So the, you're talking about the inventors' rights the resolution. Inventors rights resolution. We are looking for signatures from as many inventors as possible. 
um, go to your local representative and tell them that the PTAB either needs to be eliminated, which would be the best case scenario, but if not, to work in certain protections to ensure that once you are given a patent, you can rely on that patent. It's just like once you buy a house and you get a deed, you want to be able to rely that that's your house, that that land that you built your house on is yours. Not that somebody can come around and go, you know, you should have never been given that deed and put the question, put that in question as to whether or not you own that property that you've invested and built a house on. <laughs> and it's, it's not dissimilar. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Paula, this has been such a fascinating conversation and everyone, there's so much more depth. There's lots of tips and lots of advice in here. This is a book you were going to read cover to cover. You were going to highlight. I've already like bookmarked my pages because I didn't want to mar it. So I'm like, I'm going to come back and highlight it later after I share it with everyone. Um, but it, this is really, I, the, what people don't know, cause I didn't mention yet. I wrote a guest article for you. I wrote a guest uh, chapter for you. And cause we didn't really talk about shark tank. So as many of you know, I've interviewed some of the people who have been through shark tank on here. I've had quite a few of them as my clients and I can't, and they're very honest on the podcast, wonderfully honest here. But when I write my articles, I, I can't talk about all those details. So you gave me an opportunity to be able to talk about that. And I appreciate that Paula. So thank you for that. So there's a secret chapter in here that was written by me. That's all about shark tank. Um, and so thank you for that, that we really appreciate that. Cause we do talk about shark tank frequently here. And, but I think that the biggest message, which is that same message that's in that chapter there is that there are so many things conspiring against you things that you don't understand of how it works. And, you know, and, uh, and particularly in Shark Tank, we're pointing out that the, the show is about publicity for the sharks. It's not about, it's about them. It's not about you. The inventors are in and out, right? The sharks are there again and again. It's the same thing. These big companies, the, the Invent Helps, the Davisons, the resources like that, they're there and they're running business plays, business plans and business plays and practices and things that they're running and you're falling victim to them because you don't know how it works. So I really appreciate you. We all appreciate you, you know, pulling back the curtains and sharing from, you know, the pieces that you've picked up and the th stories that you've heard and you've helped through. So thank you so much for being that champion, Paula. Thank you, Tracy. I mean, yeah. And the other thing I just want, you know, uh, to mention about Paula that you guys should really know and understand is like she bootstrapped and pulled herself up and has an amazing story, which she shares in the book as well about how she's built herself into the attorney that she is and into the champion that she is. And that in and of itself is really a sign that she understands you. She gets what you're going through. She has a deep abiding love of people building businesses and developing them. I and you're building your own business this way too. So you know exactly how hard it is to be a business builder. Absolutely. And if there's one last parting advice I can say is just surround yourself by the right people and don't be too trusting and get recommendations, word of mouth of who you work with. Because I think, you know, good people assume that other people are good people. We they make do. in our personal relationships as we do in our business relationships. And, um, you know, learn from the mistakes of others. And that's pretty much what I tried to do in this book is to say, here are some mistakes. Here are also some great stories because it's not all doom and gloom. I want to give examples of where there was a very successful entrepreneur who, who you, know, at, you know, achieved their goals in spite of the odds because there, will, there are the odds. Right. So it, the idea is that let's succeed in spite of the odds and in some instances because of the odds because I know what happened to others and I'm going to be aware of these things. And we don't have to do this alone. And that's the beauty of it. So I say find an inventor's organization, meet up, meet with other inventors, see what works for them. But don't be so willing to overshare. Yeah, you know, this is, so as stolen on TV, Paula Brilson Phillips, you guys make sure 
buy one, go to Amazon right now. It's available. Buy one, bring it to your inventors group. I'll talk about it. Get other people interested in it. Make sure that they know about the inventors rights resolution. Make sure you're talking about that. We, are, we have a really local, um, I'm going to call it small business congresswoman champion here in um, my town. So I have Katie Porter, who you may have heard on TV. So she's a big champion and I've been working really hard to get her to comment on this. So I'm hoping I'll be able to get her to comment on it for the article because, because she is a big champion of small business rights and and, and of, of, you know, the entrepreneurs and, and uh, consumers in general. So I, I can't imagine she has a negative reaction to um, this resolution, but I'd like to hear it from her. Um, but it, it, the, one of the things that I really recommend is bringing in these kinds of outside information, things that you haven't heard before, resources, like invite Paula to your group, right? These are things, she speaks all over the place. She might be in your area. So reach out and ask because I can tell you right now, I rarely get asked to speak to an inventor's group. And yet I have hundreds of stories that I could be sharing and I share them on the show all the time. I find it's the same way that they're very closed off. And so being, being open to and inviting in and understanding these pitfalls. So removing the hope for a little bit and say, let's take a listen to what else is out there and, and the things that we can expose ourselves to and the people that might be out there that we don't know about yet would be so um, wonderful. And I think we'll create a higher success rate in your groups. Um, because we, we do hear a lot about the inventor groups, not, you know, usually you have someone who's successful and then they lead the group and they leave it because the group's not listening to how hard it was. And so, yeah, so, I mean, we know that that happens out there. So invite some new ideas in because, um, because this is information you all need to be armed with because they know exactly how you work. So Paula, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being on the show. Um, uh, as stolen on TV, stealing the American dream, one invention at a time is on a bookshelves on on a well on Amazon, right? It's not on bookshelves. Barnes and Noble, as well as directly from the Randy Cooper Foundation org website. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so great. So you will be able to find it wherever you are looking for. So as if you guys have some stories, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear your stories. Reach out on social at has design has with two Z's. Um, and I'll be sure to tag Paula and let her know about your stories as we're going through that. You can also find Paula on LinkedIn and other places. Um, we'll have links for everything and how to connect with her and um, links to the book and all of that in the blog post for this episode at productlaunchhazards.com. And as always, I'm available to you and you can reach out to me. I prefer LinkedIn, as you guys know, but you can also reach out to me straight through the website, productlaunchhazards.com and share your stories with us as well. So I look forward to hearing your feedback on this episode. Paula, thank you for coming on and product launchers, keep going. Don't lose hope. Just expand it to include a plan with your hope. Thank you all for listening. I'm Tracy Hazard. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Product Launch Hazards. To get the most out of your membership, visit productlaunchhazards.com to join the expert office hours live and ask us your burning questions. Check out the resource library for document templates and guides and get exclusive articles and shares each day. Don't forget you can always book a private consult with any expert so you can outdesign, outsource, and outprofit your way to product launch success.